Hi, welcome back to Antioch Center for the Nations. We are looking at Romans. And the last time we were together, we reached uh, verse 15, where it says that they show that the requirements of the law are written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness in their thoughts, sometimes accusing them and other times even defending them. And we talked about the equality of people on earth when by default they do what they believe is right, they do righteousness, they do good things, and I ended off saying that I have found man's righteousness, which, which by the way does not save us, but it means that people are trying their hardest to do good and God sees it and recognizes it according to Paul. I have seen it within Muslim communities and Hindu communities and certainly Christian communities, but sometimes I have seen wickedness in all the same communities. As long as there's man, um, we show the requirements of the law written in our hearts. We, we respond to the Spirit. So we're going to continue with this as Paul is speaking here about, remember we were, we were covering the, the wickedness of man or what would be the, um, this section that we're dealing, the unrighteousness, when we're covering Romans chapter 2 now. And we're going to go on now to the next verse. Uh, let's see. Yeah, verse 16, where it says that uh, this will take place on the day when the judges um, people's secrets, when God judges people's secrets. Let's read the passage together. This, this will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. In other words, there will be a time when we all give account, and Paul is speaking this concerning all of those people, whether they're Jews or not Jews. He says, now, if you call yourself a Jew, if you really or you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Who are you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And this was from the prophets where it was saying that the Jewish nation of Israel was causing blasphemy to be spoken by the nations concerning Israel and the people of God because of the hypocrisy that evolved amongst all peoples. In other words, the, the hypocrisy was the fact that they would teach, and that's where Jesus said, also remember that one moment that Jesus said, you travel land and sea to make converts or proselytes and you put heavy burdens upon them and you do not lift, lift, help them lift it with even one of your fingers. In other words, teaching religious structure and law. Remember, he's talking to the Romans concerning these laws that were proven long past impossible to keep fully. God came up with the new system of grace, and now they're trying to re-implement this. The same thing happened with the Galatians, where he said, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Do you think that you start in the spirit, now you can continue in the flesh to make things right? And of course, we know we can't. But you say to people, you should not do these things, but do you do them yourself? And this is where he's developing the idea. And he says, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. Well, that's logical, right? So if, if you are circumcised, but you act against the law, circumcision is not some cleansing practice that causes the law not to be applied to you. When you obey a bit of the law like this, uh, it's, you're under the law. But it says if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, logically, the reverse is if those who are not circumcised, in other words, those who do not perform this ritual, and that was one of the big issues of the day, were that the, 
Jewish believers were coming in and telling the Gentile believers, unless they're circumcised, they cannot go to heaven. They cannot be saved. And that also includes other laws. So he says, so if, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code in circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. This is him establishing the idea. Let's say that you're Jewish and you believe circumcision and these rituals that you keep, the customs that you specifically say are absolutely necessary. But there are other areas in which you sin, you break other segments, but somehow you do not brand that part of what you do in your activity as sinful. So that means it makes, it, ma it makes you the authority to choose what the sins are. It makes you the authority to decide that righteousness is attained by the observation of the rules on your list. See, this is exactly what happens today in denominational churches. When two or more gather in a certain place and they start a church, they maybe have a movement and they're very excited about it and all the believers believe they're all on the same page, they have the same doctrines, the same concepts, the same ideas, they pray the same way, they, they break bread the same way, they have the Lord's Supper the same way, they take up offerings the same way. So as long as they're in agreement, let's say that denomination, the one that is named this group. And that's exactly what Paul was saying at one point when he said, you know, some say I'm a Paul and some say I'm of Apollos. I'll have you know that Christ is the one. We all follow Christ. Well, when he was saying that, it was the same issue he's talking about here. The one who is not circumcised physically and yet fulfills the real intent of the law, it's as to God as if he's circumcised. So it is not about the observation of religious laws. It's about the heart, the heart of man. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by written code, not by these laws that are written. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So what is our relationship about? Religion is a relationship between people in which you are pleasing men. Relationship with God does not require religious adherence to laws and rules that man has decided are right and wrong. And I'm not saying go out there and do all manner of evil, but do not judge people if they don't keep your laws and your rules. And this is the issue with the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were believing that their cultural upbringing as Jews and now God had changed the whole process, the way God related to people. God put away, Jesus paid ultimately for the rules and the laws. He fulfilled them all for us so that we could be free, no longer under the law. But these Jews had a hard time accepting that. And because it was so real to them that they must uh, uh, observe these laws, they're putting that on these Gentile brothers. And for a while, I'm sure the Gentiles dealt with that. But when the Jews went away from Rome for five years, well, the, the Gentiles got comfortable living according to their cultural standards and relating to Jesus. Think about people who received Christ during the time that the Jews were expelled from Rome. And they now, maybe three, four, years, almost five years in Christ, they've grown, they've learned, they're flourishing, they're active members of the church, and then all of a sudden these Jews come back and they're starting to get audited or questioned about what they call faith, what they believe. And this is what Paul was trying to defend, that you cannot superimpose. A person is not a Jew who's one only outwardly. It's not by the pretense or by the, the, the structure of your performance in law. The circumcision is something inward. A Jew is, you as a Gentile are the same as a Jew if you from the heart believe in Christ. And so that is circumcision of another kind, circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. And that's what he's speaking about as he's continuing on here in, in, chapter, in chapter 2. And so it, 
it goes on all the way into chapter 3. But remember, um, we're looking at these sections that we talked about. And uh, let's review again our outline here. First, we saw greetings and gratitude toward God. Now we're, we're looking at the revelation of God's anger. And we've seen that everybody has sinned. Everybody is in a wrong place. And now we're looking at the fact that the law is not going to save you. The law is, is the circumcision of the heart, not of a physical practice. And so we're going to move on now into chapter 3. And we've been looking at chapter 2 as we're finishing the second part of this teaching. Let me get back to my page here. Yeah, here we are. Let's just take these one at a time. Chapter 3. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? In other words, um, okay, so somebody wants you to be a Jew. Is there any advantage in that? Would uh, there, if somebody's a Jew, would... Is, what value is there in circumcision? You cut the foreskin off of the man's member. What value is that? Well, Paul believes that because he was a Jew, he says actually much in every way, he says. First, he says, first of all, the Jews, the Jews, the Jewish people, have been entrusted with the very words of God. So here Paul saw the Jews as custodians of the words and also those from which it came. In other words, the law of Moses came through what? Moses. Moses was a Jew. And it was passed down. All the prophets who prophesied, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, you know, all these, these were Jews. These were Jews that that had been entrusted with the very words of God. So is there a benefit? Is there some honor to Jews? Of course there is. Paul's not becoming anti-Semitic here. He's just trying to say that there is a logic underlying that we must understand if we are to live at peace. And the Jews, they're great people. Um, he said, but what if some were unfaithful? With, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Well, we could apply this also to Christianity. If I represent Jesus as a Christian and I do my best, but then I, I am unfaithful, I slip up, I sin, I do something that offends you, does that mean that God is no longer trustworthy? And, th and this is what he's proposing here. What if some were unfaithful, some of these good people of God? Will their unfaithfulness, their error, their problem nullify or cancel out God's faithfulness to you? No, of course not. So he's establishing this idea. Same with a pastor. If you learn from a pastor, and then one day the pastor is found to be in error in sin, do you throw out everything you learn from that pastor? That's a big mistake that people make. Jesus even said, don't do as they do, do as they say, even about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, because the information is still from God. So his logic goes on, not at all. In other words, the question is, is God then unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge, he says. And this is, of course, a quote from the Old Testament passage. Let God be true and every man a liar. I remember in our church um, when I was first saved, we actually had a song let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. It was one of the verses. And I always wondered, why would it say that? But it comes from Romans. Here what Paul is saying. If I'm unfaithful, if I make a mistake, if you make a mistake, or my mentor or teacher in the faith has an error, can I blame God for that? Not at all. Let God be true. But understand that every man is at fault. Every man is sinful. Every man is a liar. Remember that whole thing he said that, that what we do, he's going to go deeper into that and show us our lost state. So that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Every man being a liar. In other words, you tell the truth that we are unworthy of, of anything. So he goes on now and says, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a uh, human argument, certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might say or argue, if my falsehood enhances God's 
truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. And this is what people claim, that his idea of grace was that they can just do whatever they want and good is going to come out of it anyway. And that is an accusation they had against Paul's doctrine. But that's not at all what Paul was saying. And he says, um, that's not true. Their condemnation is just, meaning those people who get in trouble for accusing him. Certainly not. If that were so... How could God judge the world? Someone might argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? So he's bringing about this understanding. You have to understand how God sees us in our sin, in our, our inability to be righteous, and how he maintains his righteousness as our God. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. One, their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now this is the state of Man, this is who we are. I remember as a young believer, I thought that if I continued to do good things and acts of righteousness and faithful in my church and read my Bible every day and pray that I would get better and better. And I began to establish an idea of my own righteousness, which the Bible condemns man's righteousness in that idea. We are inherently what Paul is describing here, that it says, all have turned away. They have together become worthless. And there is no one who does good, not even one, ultimately speaking. So as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. So Paul's establishing is don't ever think that by the observance of the laws as a Jew, that your righteousness is something to be purported and used and then pushed on these people, because that righteousness is not going to do anything. There is no such thing as righteousness when it comes to man. There's no such thing. He's talking about the fact that it's impossible for us to be righteous by our own strength. Nobody is. There is no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God, really. All have turned away. This is the state of man. All that it describes here in our wickedness. Now we know. That whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Now, what he's saying was everything that the Jews brought us, that the former generations of those who were the prophets that brought us all the scriptures that are wonderful, that is a great benefit. But all those laws, all those rules were established so that God could be ultimately right and that man would be ultimately wrong and that it would be proven that we have no hope and no ability to be saved by any kind of adherence to law. We are hopelessly wicked. It says that those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. In other words, every human being, everyone that walks the face of the earth are accountable to God and none of us will be declared righteous. None of us will be judged as right in God's sight by the works of the law. Even if you did every law perfectly, it still does not fix your sin problem. So through the law, we have become conscious of our sin. We know that this sin is real because of 
this. Through the law, we have become conscious of our sin. And this is the end of the part of the revelation of God's um, wrath. And now we go to part three, and we're going to continue on while we still have about 10 minutes left here in this session. The revelation of God's righteousness, Romans 2.21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. In other words, Paul is saying, according to his gospel in the Old Testament, there were prophecies that said there would come a day where the laws would no longer restrict and hold man, that their inescapable culpability would no longer apply because apart from that system of law, the righteousness of God has been made known, published, and demonstrated, to which the law and the prophets testify. In other words, they prophesied that this would come. So now as he's moving into this understanding of the revelation of God's righteousness, he's going to tell us how God saves us. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this is the, the most one of the most famous passages of Scripture concerning our eligibility of salvation. Apart from the law, there is no saving. You cannot, um, there is no, uh, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made new, but because under the law, you can't do it. And the Jews this is the whole issue. The Jews in Rome, who he's writing this to, had come back with a very legal mentality and tried to put it on the Gentiles. But so now that's the same for us today. Do you want people to come and put laws on you? No, I want this system apart from the law. I, it's been made known to me because I've heard of what Jesus did. This righteousness, this new kind of righteousness, not one that comes by law, but one that comes by uh, faith. It says the righteousness is given through faith through believing in Jesus Christ, anyone who believes this is eligible. There's no difference. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or you're Gentile because all of us, Jews and Gentiles, and no matter what, agnostic, atheist, Muslim, Hindu, whatever you want to call yourself, Buddhist, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God according to God's words, according to what Paul is saying here, we've all sinned and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So now this is the righteousness to be right or wrong and right standing with God. The only way it can happen is if we are straightened out, if our sin, we fall short of the glory of God. But now, when we believe in Jesus, we are justified. That means you are straightened out. Uh, that means you are, are forgiven of whatever penalties there were, justified freely, not by any kind of works, but freely by this grace. And the, the word grace means unmerited favor. In other words, you get it free. It's free. It's gratis. It is 100% without price. This comes through the redemption, the redeeming, the replacement sacrifice that came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came and paid every penalty that the law incurred and brought upon us at once for all. And then when we believe in Jesus, we are then justified freely because of this unmerited favor, this grace. And the Jews need this and the Gentiles need this. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same dilemma. The wrath of God is on us all, but now the revelation of God's righteousness is shown here, starting in verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. You and I both know it, to which the law and the prophets testify, everything written in the Old Testament. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. You and I believe in Jesus, all of us, to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, whatever nation, whatever religion, it doesn't matter because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But we're also justified equally freely by this unmerited favor that comes through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And that is really, really good news. So this is what God did. God presented Christ as a sacrifice. In other words, when the Lord sent, God, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He goes on to say this, God presented Christ 
as a sacrifice of atonement, replacement, substitute, vicarious. In other words, like when you give money and someone gives you a loaf of bread in exchange, that, that barter, that, that the atoning money pays and the value of the bread is then passed to you in replacement of that. That's what this means. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of payment or atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. When we believe that Jesus bled on the cross, we believe that God the Father gave him as a sacrifice. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness as the present at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In other words, God Almighty, our God, he took Jesus, his own son, he gave him over as a sacrifice. This is not unlike Abraham, the father of our faith, and later Paul's going to talk about this in this letter to the Romans. That's like Abraham being asked for Isaac, and Isaac gave him as a sacrifice. That was a prophetic gesture of what the Father has done for us. Jesus had to pay the price we could not pay because we're all under the curse of the law. But Jesus is the only one that could pay it. He's the only one that could atone through the shedding of his blood that we have to believe. It's received by faith, received by believing. Do you believe that Jesus really did that? Of course he did. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. In other words, man's righteousness was, it, they tried to get it by obeying the laws, but his righteousness, God's righteousness, that comes as a free gift, in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. In other words, those sins that had been committed through the centuries by man, there was no retribution for those, no punishment, and he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. In other words, at the moment that Jesus was revealed and died for us, so as to be just, so that he and his justness, and remember, you don't, you don't want fair, you want God's version of justice. You want God's uh, grace and mercy. So as to be just in the one who, that is God, justifies. He's the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So, what do we do to get saved? What do we do to get salvation? We do nothing. So, how could we possibly brag as a Jew or a Gentile or any believer? How can Christians ever say, look at my righteousness? And that's why he goes on to say here, where then is boasting or bragging? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. In other words, all you have to do is believe. Uh, for we cannot say that we've done this. You can't say that um, we go up into heaven and bring Jesus down or down into earth, Paul says, in another place, and raise him up from the dead. We weren't even there. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. When he says we, he means you and me and the gospel according to Paul. We maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. We do. Amen. We are justified by faith. Now, the doctrines that we believe, everything that we confess, we're slowly seeing written here in the letter to the Romans, but it's going to become more and more clear as Paul continues to plead this case for God's justice being a free gift for all people. And that there is no Jew, Gentile, no Scythian, no Greek, no anything. All are exactly the same because we're all in the same boat of sinful destruction. We are all guilty. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so God gave Jesus an atoning payment in our place. And how can we possibly boast or brag we didn't do anything? And we maintain this. You and I, our, our doctrine is that a person is justified. He's made right by faith, by simply believing apart from the physical workings of laws, apart from doing something, 
our justification, our cleansing, our renewal, our right standing with God has nothing to do with what we do, but simply what we believe. And he will continue to labor this point on and on in this letter, but we're going to save that for our next class and this justice that he's given us. We're so grateful. Thank you, God, for, for, for setting us free. Thank you, God, for not holding us to the law, but setting us free from the law, Jesus having paid for it all. Amen? It's a great book, and we're going to have so much fun studying the rest of it. Until next time, God bless you.